Hello everybody, this is Fernando for the all new Mafia and Gangsters video. Alright, let's go ahead and let's do another entry here. This one based on one of your newer suggestions. I think I'm going to wrap it up after this video, at least for this go around, give it a rest and then start working on other videos too. Four should be a good total when it comes to this series. So thank you so much again everyone for your suggestions. This one has to do with a criminal that was actually involved with a very notorious massacre. I'm sure you've heard of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Well, as it turns out, he was a part of it, and I'll explain more on that later on. Plus, I was able to actually go see the wall that was used there within the massacre, and I'll include um, pictures of that too. So how about that? I got to see the actual wall used in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, and now I'm going to talk about the criminal that was actually a part of it. So quite a small world when it comes to that. But you're looking at him now. Uh, this was a gangster that went by the name of Fred Burke, but as it turns out, that was more of a change of names or a pseudonym of sorts. As always, though, they went by another nickname, and in this case, it was Fred Killer Burke, which definitely suited him because of the notorious stuff that he did, the, some of the bad things, in fact, that he did. That I'll talk about that more, too, just in a minute. So let's go ahead and let's share all the information associated with Fred Killer Burke. So who was this guy, Fred Killer Burke? Well, he was actually born Thomas A. Camp. That's why I mentioned that his name, Fred Burke, was a different name altogether, almost like a pseudonym. But back when he was Thomas A. Camp, he was born in Mapleton, Kansas back in 1893. In fact, he was one of eight children, which just goes to show the times. I remember the other person I just talked about, he was like one of 15 children. Here, in this case, he was one of eight children. And growing up in that area, even at a young age, apparently he was remarked as having an above average intelligence. He apparently was doing well, especially when it came to Sunday schools and the way teachers praised him. But somewhere along the way, at age 17, he just decided to involve himself in criminal acts. And that's where it started at that point and it pretty much continued up until the day he died. And he died at a relatively youngish age. So more on that too later on. But yes, he was involved, if you can believe this, in a land fraud scheme. This was actually a theme that continued throughout his criminal career. You'll hear me mention that here several times. But yes, he was there with a traveling salesman. He must have been used as some kind of, I don't know if it was like a bait or a front man to have unsuspecting victims come up to this land fraud scheme. But either way, though, he was involved with it. And when they were found and they were about to be prosecuted, he fled. He actually went to another location altogether, in this case, Kansas City, Missouri. And then that's when he changed his name to Fred Burke. And that's how the name, for the most part, changed throughout the rest of his life. Like it stayed that name. More on that too later on because he went by a whole bunch of other aliases. That just seemed to be his mantra. He was always changing his names to evade any kind of prosecution. But it was then when he was like uh, still in his youngish age and by the 1915 that he became a member of a gang there in St. Louis, Missouri that was known as the Egan's Rats. If you wanted to say that this was probably the point where he cemented his criminal activity, you'd be right. This was a time when he was actually in his uh, 1920s, 1930s, he was basically doing a full-blown criminal career at that point. And what was interesting was that still he was used as a front man by the gang to do a lot of various forgery and then fraud-like schemes. The way he looked, apparently it created like the sense of instant I don't know if it was honesty or honest looking, uh, let's say, uh, front. Like people would see him and thought, think to themselves, you know what, this is a guy that I want to do business with. And so the gang used his looks in order to be able to lure once again unsuspecting victims and then the forgery and fraud schemes would be done and then they would run off and so this Egan gang along with this guy Fred Burke were able to have much success associated with this but two years later he was caught and before he was indicted in this case for forgery he enlisted in the U.S. Army this was during a time period of World War One. so I think at that time someone correct me if I'm wrong but you were given a choice as 
well there where either a go to prison or b go to the army someone mentioned uh, please let me know if that's wrong or if it's more of all lines if he was automatically drafted either way though he was in the u.s army for world war one for i think about maybe two or three years and he ended up serving as a tank sergeant somewhere there in france eventually he was discharged made it sound like he was just discharged on his own like nothing bad happened and then once he came back and he landed in michigan yet again there he was committing fraud he was back to his usual thing in this case he was also doing once again land fraud which remember i mentioned that he was doing this back when he was 17 now just a little bit older there he was doing the same thing there and yet again he was caught he spent a year in prison and then went to another year in missouri for another prison but once he was able to get out for that sentence by this point it was 1922 once again Again, he joined Egan's Rats as far as that gang goes to show that he was always going to be a criminal no matter how many times he evaded things or how many times he went to jail. He was always going to be a part of it. And it was at that point that he committed more serious crimes. These were on the lines of robberies, probably armed robberies too. In one case, he committed a robbery of $80,000 from a St. Louis distillery. And then when other members of the gang ended up being imprisoned, that's when he went back to uh, Michigan. And then he became part of another gang there that was called the Purple Gang of Detroit, there in Detroit, Michigan. And so what was interesting is at this point, he was still with another gang, but he was working with uh, other associates there and then committing more bad crimes. So much so, in fact, I think at at this point, it was involved not just in murders, but armed robberies too. So very, very serious stuff, officially very serious stuff. And it caught the attention of none other than Al Capone. Apparently, this guy Burke and some of his other associates became notorious for their acts of violence. And so Al Capone started to bring him in for his jobs. And then he uh, noted them as being his quote unquote American boy. So him and then as far as his other associates, they all started to work with Capone. And then throughout a bunch of places from Brooklyn, New York to Patterson, New Jersey to Louisville, Kentucky to Toledo, Ohio, all of that stuff. This guy, uh, Fred Killer Burke, I imagine at that point too, his nickname started to become more of a mantra. Uh, they committed all these acts of crimes and then they were just heavily involved in these, in these particular uh, gruesome murders in some cases. Now, what happened later on though, as far as the St. Valentine's Day massacre was this. Um, apparently at that point, him and some of his associates they dressed up, of course, as police and then took out some of these gang members that were associated with Bugs Morin. And then under the command of Al Capone, that's when they basically shot them and they shot them in the garage using a bunch of Tommy guns and then using um, a bunch of bullets as well to, to kill these members. I think there was a total of about five or seven. Someone might might you correct me on that too. But either way though, it became notorious because of the large amount of murders, the numbers that happened on that night, the fact that it happened in, of course, Valentine's Day, and then also the fact that it was almost uh, a notorious move, like a genius move as far as dressing up as cops in order to lure some of these other members of this gang out without any kind of resistance and then just basically blowing them away. So once that happened, Burke went on the run and even then you would think that he would keep things silent, you know, because at the, because the police and the FBI, they all started thinking that, yes, this was him and his associates because they started from the top down. They realized that Al Capone would have been involved in something like this. And so whenever that happened, you would think that Burke would just lie down. Uh, but no, he continued, even after that point, committing armed robberies and then doing other type of murders. In fact, the next one definitely took things to another level. Apparently, Apparently in 1929, he became uh, drunk one night, and then at that point, he crashed into another car, but it became more than lines of a hit and run. And so there was a cop, a patrolman by the name of Charles Scalay, who saw that happen, and when he did so, he, he tried to give chase to the car that Fred Burke, Fred Killer Burke was driving. He actually went on top of that board that's on the side of the car, because uh, Fred Killer Burke was just driving away at the time. Time. Remember, it's going to be a hit and run. 
Unfortunately, though, this poor patrolman, uh, Charles Calais, was then shot and killed by Burke, pretty much point blank, right there uh, on the side of the car. And then it was he was immediately changed to another level. Like in this case, the FBI moved him to the 10 most wanted fugitives. So clearly, not only because of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, not only because of all the other things that occurred um, as far as New York, New Jersey, and Kentucky, and now this, he was absolutely placed in the top 10 most wanted, and then he was gone. Like uh, He evaded capture for a little while. He fled to Missouri. Uh, there was a bunch of rewards associated with his capture. There was a $1,000 reward, which I was a huge amount at a time, with little notes on there indicating how dangerous this man was. And he started to use a bunch of other aliases. So he used the names like Fred Dean, Fred Campbell, Theodore Cameron, and then also Richard F. White, which would be his last alias used in his life. But get this, during that same time period, remember I was mentioning you would think, now being on the 10 most wanted fugitives list, that he would not do anything else to catch attention. Well, even though he was considered above intelligence, remember I was mentioning that as a young age, something happened later on because he was going to make a bunch of dumb choices, including, in this case, committing a bunch of crim criminal acts, continue to do so everywhere that he lived. Apparently, he still uh like he took up residence in green city somewhere in sullivan county and then he also took up residence at another area called kirksville missouri at a hotel known as traveler's hotel so not only was he committing acts but he also committed a bank robbery all this attention coming on to him and not only that but he ended up getting married apparently he married a woman by the name of bonnie porter and she, in turn, would claim no knowledge of any of his identity, which I would kind of believe because him changing his aliases, changing his, his identity so many times that by the time she met him, she would have no idea that he who he was as far as his past. She would just probably see him as just, as she described it, a businessman who happened to travel a lot. But still, so much notoriety, the FBI was still hunting him, not let alone the police, that it turns out he was placed in a magazine, like his picture was placed in a magazine called True Detective. And at the time when he was living in Green City, someone there, just a regular citizen, happened to see his picture. And then they realized, oh my God, this is not Fred, uh, this is not Richard White. This is not the alias Richard White. In this case, it's the killer, in this, uh, Fred Killer Burke. And so they turned him in, and Fred uh, Killer Burke was captured in his home of his father-in-law without incident. Immediately, he was convicted. He was taken back uh, to Michigan to serve out. He was in particularly sentence for the murder of Officer Scalay. But once he went in, it was at that point that he was uh, apparently a very ill health, like he had severe diabetes and severe heart disease. So shortly after he was sentenced, he ended up dying right there in prison on July 10th, 1940. So that's pretty much it as far as the life and the criminal career associated with Fred Killer Burke. Now I was mentioning earlier too, as far as the piece of history, while well, you're looking at it now, this is the actual wall that was involved in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. It's there at the Mob Museum in Las Vegas. It's there on prominent display uh, behind the uh, plexiglass, if I recall correctly, like it's behind the glass, but I think even the glass gets moved but yes i've seen it twice now and if you go there you can see it um, i think it's on the second floor but you'll get to see it in person and you'll get to see the bullet holes that have been left from the massacre itself so if you want to see a true piece of history involving the mafia involving the gangster world there it is right there, and I got to see it myself, and it's always a popular tourist spot. So as far as taking pictures or selfies or anything like that, you might have a tough time. Uh, I know I did when I was trying to take just a regular picture, but it's well worth going out there and then seeing the actual piece of wall. So how about that and as far as the history associated with it? On that infamous night when, uh, in this case, Fred Killer Burke had a Tommy gun dressed as a police officer, and then he was shooting those uh, gangsters there um, i'm looking at the actual remnants of that act right there but if anyone has any more info anything else i might have let's say missed or gotten incorrect please post those comments below always love to hear uh, any other type of, of information associated with the subject matters in my videos so all right everyone thanks again as always take care